Welcome to Discovering. Tonight we'll take a look at some of the Upper Peninsula's unique history. First, it's a trip to the Michigan Iron Industry Museum for a look at a Marble Arms exhibit. Another product that the Marble Arms uh, company produced was the Game Getter Gun. Then it's off to the Marquette Regional History Center to check out a variety of unique UP collectibles. That's all tonight, so sit back, put your feet up. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill Soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Webster Marble came to Gladstone in 1887 and five years later began manufacturing his first invention, the Marble's Universal Rifle Sight. Marble Arms grew to be one of the foremost manufacturers of gun sights. Products expanded to include outdoor goods like the safety axe, knives, match safes, compasses, and the Marble's Game Getter Combination Gun. The company remains an important member of the firearm and shooting sports industry to this day. The exhibit we have here on display at the Michigan Iron Industry Museum is called Inventing the Outdoors. It's the story of Webster Marble and the Marble Arms Company that he founded in the late 1800s, which thrived through the early 1900s. Uh, Webster Marble was, a, uh, was an innovator and uh, an inventor and um, uh, a master marketer, and he, through uh, being a timber cruiser uh, in the North Woods in the late 1800s saw needs and he invented products to fulfill those needs and uh, marketed them across the world. So uh, this was a company based out of Gladstone and um, it still actually continues to this day in Gladstone uh, where they focus on, on gun sites. Webster Marble identified four basic essentials uh, in terms of equipment that a person going into the outdoors really needs. The first was a good durable knife, uh, the second was a, a safety axe, third was a compass, and the fourth was a way to keep your matches dry, the match box safe. All of these items were based on his personal experience and improvements upon design and invention and uh, really, you know, kind of boiled it down to these four basic things that any outdoors person needed going into the woods and uh, advertised, you know, the four basic essentials uh, as such. Webster Marble's father, his name was Lansing Marble, when they lived in Milwaukee, had invented a machine to make staved baskets. And uh, I don't know if an invention was in, in his blood or not, but he was uh, a very prolific inventor. He had 60 patents uh, over the course of his career. But he always realized that you know, invention was based on a need. And as a timber cruiser in the North Woods of um, uh, Wisconsin and in the UP, he realized the need to have quality equipment that was lightweight, uh, very functional, uh, and in, in a lot of cases, multi-purpose. And uh, some of the things that we have on display here, for example, are a, a trout knife for cleaning trout, uh, that has a little ring for your pinky so that the knife would not slip while you were uh, filleting a trout. We also have a, a fish knife which has a kind of a handle for your thumb so that you can apply pressure when you're filleting a fish or you know cutting off a tail or the head of a fish. And of course the matchstick safe which he invented based on the idea of he actually put matches between two shotgun shells and then invented the matchstick safe based on that idea. So his inventions, he was also you know, continually improving upon them. 
um, through trial and error and making his products um, better and better uh, over time. Webster Marble was, uh, was an inventor and he was uh, a great marketer and uh, he went to New York City in the, in the late um, 1800s to put his products on display, uh, specifically the safety axe that he invented. Uh, it was one of his first products that he invented and marketed and uh, there was a lot of success with that and um, we have um, uh, here we have a trade show case uh, with a, a lot of the products that Marble uh, produced over the years um, displayed similar to how he displayed it in New York City in the, the late 1800s. Uh, Michigan around the turn of the century, um, you know, shortly after 1900, people were viewing the outdoors a little bit differently and were able to experience the outdoors differently. Chicago Northwestern Railroad had, was really promoting areas like the UP as a destination to experience the outdoors. The trains which one, once carried timber resources could easily carry passengers up into the region too. With the Ford Model T making the automobile very practical for everyday Americans, uh, you could travel to places like the UP to experience the outdoors. So what a better place than Gladstone to build a factory producing all this outing equipment where people could use those products and equipment and experience the outdoors right in their backyards uh, in addition to um, people from Detroit or Chicago being able to easily access uh, the Upper Peninsula as well. The Marble Company, you know, experienced uh, ups and downs along with the nation and the products uh, reflected that. They produced knives like the Outdoors Knife or the Outers Knife which were very functional but sleek in design with either a bone handle or a wood handle uh, and this was produced during the depression so people could uh, purchase one of these knives for a for dollar and, and have a good quality knife uh, during that era of, of hard times. The Woodcraft was a um, design that made it excellent for skinning um, animal hides and the trail maker. It was the largest knife that um, Marbles produced and it was used for almost like a machete for cutting underbrush and brush out in the woods. There were many different uh, designs uh, for the knives that uh, Marble produced based on different needs of the customer who was either using them or you know wanting them for display purposes. Yeah, Marble would uh, partner with different companies and customize products. For instance, he partnered with uh, the Brown Shoe Company and uh, customized a knife for uh, people who were just buying brown shoes. Uh, so when they bought those shoes, they would get the Marble knife. And uh, engraved on those knives, you can see the Brown Shoe Company. Another product that the Marble Arms uh, Company produced was the Game Getter Gun. And again, through Webster Marble's personal experience in the woods, sometimes realized that, you know, in one instance you could hunt small game, in another instance you'd want to hunt larger game. Instead of carrying two weapons, uh, he invented the Game Getter, uh, where the top barrel is a 22 caliber, uh, the bottom barrel is a 44 caliber, where you could also have a 410 shotgun shell put into the bottom barrel. And it folded up, uh, you could wear it in a holster, you know, another very efficient, effective invention from Marble. Marble built quality outdoors equipment, uh, but he also realized that um, a good percentage of the merchandise or the products that he was going to sell were probably never going to be used. Uh, people, um, you know, wanted to acquire the products and, um, you know, he was kind of selling a dream in a way. Uh, where people would acquire the Marble Arms products and, and even if they never did get out into the woods or, or into the outdoors uh, to use those products, they could almost sort of be a, a fill-in for the actual experience. And, and Marble understood that and um, uh, marketed uh, that idea of selling a dream very effectively.
By the early 1900s, marble was a household name. And in part, obviously, this stemmed from making a very quality product and marketing, marketing it effectively. But uh, Webster Marble also understood the, the value of celebrity endorsements. He marketed with celebrity endorsements like Theodore Roosevelt, who used uh, marble equipment um, on his expeditions. Uh, Charles Lindbergh had marble equipment on his transatlantic flight and uh, Admiral Perry uh, up in the Arctic also had marble equipment and that fact could be marketed uh, to the world as well. The exhibit will be here at the, at the museum for about a year through October uh, 2017. This exhibit began when a, um, a collector from downstate donated a, a sizable collection of Marble Arms products that he had acquired over the years. Uh, this exhibit was a temporary exhibit down at the uh, Lansing branch of the museum for about a year and uh, seeing that this is a, a very much of a UP story, um, the exhibit or a portion of that traveling exhibit came up here uh, to this museum so people up in the UP can see it and appreciate this company um, that is so much a UP story. Paid a visit to the Marquette Regional History Center to check out a special exhibit called Marquette County Collects. Well, we have this exhibit going on, Marquette County Collects. It's up here in our special exhibit gallery until the end of the year, through the end of December. And it's been a really great exhibit and really well received. Um, we've got all these collectors from around the county. Um, for instance, we have uh, Bill Venkoski, who is a wonderful bottle collector and a really great uh, member here. So these are early soda bottles from Marquette County. A lot of these date uh, turn of the century. There's even a couple bottles. There's got these wire closures on them, but they're the wrong type of glass for that closure. So that means they're most likely they were used by bootleggers. And then we have this wonderful collection of wigwam tins and containers from Colleen Aho. And that came from the Carpenter Cook distributor down in Menominee. You put them together and you have a really great display in your kitchen. This is a collection of campaign buttons from Judd Spray, mostly from presidential campaigns. And I think his earliest button goes back to the 1877 campaign with Rutherford B. Hayes. So it was about the 1870s and 80s when they were starting making these plastic buttons. It's great to see. This is a collection of paint by number pieces uh, collected by Jess Schull. They were a bit controversial because people said, well, that's not real art, of course. But it really did get people mixing paints. If you look at the colors and the style, they're really interesting. Uh, this is a collection of World's Fair memorabilia collected by Russ Mignaghi. Some of the older pieces are more valuable and rare. It's really an interesting time. New inventions were shared. This is a tie collection from Nick Dupra. Uh, most of these are from the 30s and 40s. This little knit tie on the end is from the 20s. This is his earliest one. There's a lot of stories behind, of course, all the different uh, companies that made them. Bob Butchko has this wonderful autograph collection from Anatomy of a Murder when the film uh, was produced here and filmed here in Marquette County. So he has many photographs and autographs and a lot of personal stories um, to go with that. I collect autographs. I've been doing that since high school and uh, I've amassed quite a large collection. I have actually several autograph collections. Uh, one of them happens to be the cast and crew of Anatomy of a Murder. But, uh, I've managed to collect all of the major stars of the movie except one who's really quite rare. Uh, that's the guy who played Floyd the Barber and Andy Griffith, Howard McNear. Well, Jimmy Stewart was, of course, the star of the movie. He uh, was nominated for Best Actor for this film. So was George C. Scott and Arthur O'Connell. They were all nominated, but and the movie was nominated for Best Picture, but Ben-Hur swept the awards that year, so it didn't win anything. But it's turned out to be a, a real classic and one of Jimmy Stewart's uh, best movies, really. Uh, Lee Remick was a newcomer at the time, and uh, they said she went to church at St. John's Church downtown every day. 
And uh, Ben Gazzara was fairly new in the films. And George C. Scott, he was fairly new also. So they were up and coming stars that were in this film. Catherine Grant was uh, actually Catherine Crosby. She was married to Bing Crosby at the time. And she's one of the few stars who's still alive, along with Orson Bean. Eve Arden was just coming out of her fame from the TV show Armis Brooks, so she was a big star at the time. But even the jail keeper, John Quaylen, he goes way back. He played Newt Rockney's father in uh, the Newt Rockney All-American, I believe, with uh, Ronald Reagan. Yeah, the movie came out in 59. The, the book came out in 57, I think, something like that. And the, based on a real life murder and trial that took place, uh, I think about 1953, I could be wrong with that date, but John Volker was the author of the book, Anatomy of a Murder, and he used the pen name Robert Traver, and he'd already written some books, but this one got him on the national bestseller list for many weeks. And I knew John Volker personally, and my dad knew him quite well. So that was kind of neat, too. It's one of the first movies to be filmed entirely on location and do all the work up here. They, they made a, a film laboratory out of somewhere in the area. And Duke Ellington wrote the score for the movie. Uh, he wrote it while he was here. That went on to become uh, one of his classic recordings, the score from Anatomy of a Murder. It's a little known fact, but Duke Ellington actually played for a, some kind of dance put on by young people in town related to one of the schools. And he just showed up with his band and played it. They were just dancing to records prior to that. So that was, imagine your sorority dance or whatever it was, it was Duke Ellington and his band playing. This is Connie Waltz, Pin and Brooch Collection. And this is a piece she wears on the 4th of July, uh, working at the Michigami Parade there. And they're just beautiful all put together. This is a collection of Blue Mountain Pottery from Judy Conrad. This is a fairly unusual collection to have all of the pieces with the ark, which was used as the display model. The pieces are beautiful and um, kind of unusual. Well, this is a unique collection from Neil Kuhlman of flashlights. And I think Neil really is the one that got me really going on this exhibit because I was just really encouraged to include his, his collection here. And I think it's really unique and wonderful and it speaks to all of us because how many people haven't had a flashlight or remember an old flashlight from they were a kid or something their grandma had. And they're really wonderful and they all tell a different story. I started this collection uh, oh, probably 12, 13 years ago and um, it kind of started with uh, one flashlight, uh, this red one up the top that my brother brought over to me and uh, said, you remember this? We, we had it when we were kids and uh, from there I started to research things on uh, eBay and uh, on online. It just kind of got out of hand. and. Uh, about 500 uh, flashlights later, I found a lot of these kind of kind of interesting. The story behind them, the name itself, flashlight, is something that's used used in the United States. Uh, in England, they call it a torch. The term flashlight comes from the very beginnings of some of these, where the batteries weren't that good. The first lamps also weren't very good and they failed and so a lot of times they got a flash of light and then uh, it would go off and then it was the old uh, get it going again thing so a uh, flashlight it's a case that holds the batteries and the cases were made out of usually brass the outside of them they wanted a nice look and they want it polished and so most of them were covered in nickel and nickel looks like most people think of chrome today. This blue one here that looks uh, kind of like a shell, um, it was uh, made in the 30s. General Mills uh, and some of the other manufacturers uh, would actually buy these things and put it in as a gift. Uh, one next to it, it looks like a little candy dispenser and what it actually is is a skater's lamp. Back in the 20s and 30s when the kids were out skating on the ponds, they would have these, not necessarily to light the way, but they could see each other. Uh, in the end of World War I, uh, 
Winchester, who made uh, arms and ammunition, uh, after World War I, they didn't have any, basically, uh, anywhere to sell anything. So they decided to go into making uh, consumer goods. And for about 20 years, they made uh, flashlights, ice skates, and anything they could for a consumer market. They were way out in front of their time because it, it dates from about 1927, 1928. And the, this material that they, they used it was kind of a plastic type stuff and it was real slick. Um, next to it is a little box lantern, it looks like. It was mounted on a bicycle back in 1900 and that's where this dates from. You either had a horse or a bicycle, it was before automobiles. So they would mount this on the, their bikes. On one side and on the other, there's these little jewels and one is green and one is red and you still see it today on airplanes and on boats and ships. Uh, and basically uh, is telling right and left. On the side uh, of, of some of the uh, flashlights, uh, there is a patent date on it and it can help you uh, determine when it was made. But for everything here and all the flashlights out there, there's only one thing that they'll allow them to patent and that is the switch. For EverReady, I can determine uh, when it was made, what kind it is by the switch and by the end cap because they changed their logos uh, you know, every few years. And so it's, it's very easy to determine on a, uh, and I'm never ready uh, when it was made. The small ones down there that take two C batteries were called back then baby lights. And for special occasions, um, they didn't cover this ivory colored one um, with brass. It is actually uh, gold plated. And so it was a special gift, uh, gold plated that they would present to somebody at uh, some award or something. There's a couple down here. One is brass and one is nickel or silver colored and it's hammered out. These are very collectible and expensive. There's not very many of them left around, but uh, they're kind of a couple of my prize items. If you want to check out the Marquette County Collects exhibit, you'll need to hurry. It ends on December 29th. Something else you might want to check out, Richard P. Smith will be doing book signings at Book World Stores on Wednesday the 21st in Ironwood from 3 to 6, from 2 to 8 in Marquette on the 22nd, and in Escanaba on the 23rd. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week, right here on Discovering.